Hi there, I'm Jenny Warrens from our Birmingham campus. On behalf of all of us here at Kensington, welcome. I think there's a reason you're here today and that maybe God has something specifically for you in today's service. And we've been looking forward to today for months now. Know why? It's our fall groups kickoff. That means our small groups, courses, and care workshops are starting up again. Each one of these are what we call jump in opportunities, a place for you to connect and grow. We believe building community and authentic relationships is a vital part of our spiritual journey. So here are just some of the opportunities we have for everyone this fall. Hi, I'm Charlotte Kelly, Discipleship Director at Orion Campus, and I know that Kensington can seem like a really big place and it could feel easy to get lost. So we're working hard to create opportunities for you to connect with others. I'm excited to share with you just a little bit about our small groups. Most groups meet regularly, usually weekly, in people's homes, coffee shops, or wherever it works best to study the Bible, to discuss the weekend service, or just to do life together. And we have all sorts of small groups. We have groups for families, couples, singles, for men only or women only. We even have a group for newlyweds and another at Orion doing great dates for couples. We believe that God designed all of us to be in relationship with others and to not do life alone. So I would love for all of you to check out what our small groups have to offer. I wanted to tell you about our courses, which are another great way to jump in this fall. Courses meet for several weeks on a topic that's important to you. It's a great way to invest in your growth while connecting with like-minded people. Here are some courses that may interest you. Alpha is a discussion course where you can explore questions about life and who God is. You listen to a teaching on a key theme of the Christian faith and then participate in a group reflection. Alpha is for everyone. There's no question too big and no topic that's off limits. Another course created right here at Kensington for your own community is Bible Basics. When you invest time in understanding the mysteries of the Bible, that's time well spent. So whether you're new to the Bible or have been reading it for decades, this course will give you an understanding of Scripture's big picture and how all the books of the Bible flow together. We've also heard great things from our couples who have taken the marriage course. This is an opportunity to strengthen and grow your marriage, whether you've been married for six months or 40 years. And whether you're in a good season or you're struggling, you'll get practical support to communicate more effectively, understand each other's needs, resolve conflict, and more. Hi, I'm Adrienne Dundon, and I am really passionate about our care initiatives because I have seen the incredible impact they have had on real people during their hardest seasons of life. Being a participant and a leader in our Celebrate Recovery ministry over the last eight years has equipped me with the tools to be able to walk through and process the uncertainty of this season that we have been walking through. After the year and a half that we've had, so many of us need a safe place to heal and to process. So maybe it's not time to jump into a traditional small group. Maybe it's your time to pursue your own wholeness. The goal of our care initiatives is to provide a safe, distraction-free place where you can heal from the hurts of life and be equipped for the adventures of life. We offer divorce recovery, grief recovery, blended family workshops, and ongoing celebrate recovery for the whole family. We also support marriages and families with mentorships, classes, special small groups, and marriage preparation. When facing hard times, tough decisions, or stressful circumstances, investing in yourself is so important. We believe that Jesus is at the center of working through the healing process, and that process can be helped by walking alongside others. We've been through more than a year of isolation, transition, and loss, haven't we? Many of us are in need of real community now more than ever. Now God knows you and sees you and made us to live in relationship. So don't let today go by without investigating all your choices to get connected here at Kensington. Find a group near you by visiting kensingtonchurch.org slash groups and filtering by your zip code and preferences. Or come out after services to the lobby and we'll be waiting to answer your questions about groups, courses, and care initiatives. Take the first step and we'll help you find the group that's right for you, no matter your life stage, interests, or needs. Well, good morning. good morning. I'm so glad to be with you. My name is Danny. We haven't met before. Glad you're here. Every, of course, everyone in the room, but also everyone on stream. Now, now, this weekend, our Troy campus is our featured campus for all of our campuses. So if you're joining uh, from Clinton Township or Orion or Traverse City or wherever you are, Clarkston, Birmingham, uh, our Brazil Church in the chapel right now, we just welcome you. And, of course, we're going to say hi to you. So on the count of three, let's say hi to everyone watching stream. One, two, three. We are glad. You know, years ago we had a, a saying 
one church, multiple locations. And we really haven't used that in, in years, but it's so true. And it's so beautiful to be connected to all of you today. So I'm glad that you're tuning in. Well, uh, what, what uh, Jenny talked about in the team, connecting, we're gonna, we're gonna talk more and more about that uh, today. There's a lot of opportunities that we kick off this fall, but I am here with Taylor. She's one of our great leaders and she works and really has influence during one of our ministries that I think have had profound impact with our children. So tell us a little bit about that. Amazing. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> so I get to be a part of Kaleo Arts, which is a program for kindergarten through fifth graders where we get to sing, we get to dance, we get to act and perform an amazing performance as well as I love this program, especially because we really get to raise up young leaders that teach us amazing things. And so we actually have our next session kicking off at Troy this coming Wednesday. And it's every Wednesday at 4.30 for about a semester long through December. And we would love your children, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews to be a part of it. And our session, it's called Dream for a While, if you see it up there. And it is all about cultivating the dreams within our students. And so we have original stories, original music, and even some original music written by our students. And so that's where we have a special opportunity for Jenna Bollinger, who's going to sing a song right now that she has actually written herself. And she's a graduate from our program, so she's not a little fifth grader. She's old now and amazing. And um, you're gonna be able to just get a sneak peek of the magic um, that is Kaleo. And so I will be in the lobby afterwards and would love to talk to you about this amazing program. Great, thanks Taylor. Hey, um, <laughs> Jenna, when I look at you, don't think old. You know, but here's what I want you to know about Jenna. I've known Jenna since she was a little girl, and I actually got to sit in the chapel with her. I don't know how old you were, but you were a songwriter back then in elementary school, and we sat next to each other. I had my guitar. She had hers. She had written a song, and we finished it together and was recorded. She was a great songwriter then, even better now, but the thing I love about her so much, when she sings, she activates my heart for Christ. I'm not kidding you. Her voice is directly connected to her heart and soul, so I'm so glad that you get to share what God has given you. Just take this in. to the final destination there's beauty to take in mm -hmm. I'm here for the voyage not for the landing though the winds keep changing your sails are withstanding so I'm here for the journey where you are is where I want to be on the way
much, Jenna. What a great song, guys, huh? I love hearing what's coming out of, of our community. A little bit later today, we're going to be talking about something we all deal with, dealing with anxiety, dealing with being overwhelmed. But before we get there, if you could, would you stand with me? Because before we talk about that, we want to sing about a God who, Scripture says, He fights our battles for us. He's in it with us. So let's celebrate this great truth together.
Hey, good morning again, everybody. You all can have a seat. Hey, if we have not met, my name is Andrew and I'm one of the pastors here. And I wanna say welcome all of you to those of you in the room, to those of you watching on stream as well. And as I was listening to that song, it just reminded me that so oftentimes life is a battle. Have anyone experienced that before? Of course, every single one of us has. And one of the incredible promises that God gives us is that when we experience these times, these seasons in our lives, that we do not have to experience them on our own. Because most importantly, he's with us, but at the same time, he also provides other people around us to walk through those seasons together. And if you are not in community right now, if you don't have those people that you're walking with right now, Right, this time, even today, is a great time to jump in and say yes to community because we have small groups, we have care groups, we have courses that are kicking off right now. And all that information can be found online or via our app. But for those of us here in the room, we'd also love to talk to you. And so if you have questions, if you would like to um, have more information, if you would like to jump in, all you have to do is when you go out into the lobby, you'll see all these banners out there, whether it be Alpha, Bible Basics, and a bunch of other ones, and we'd love for you to stop and have a conversation. Also, our new discipleship director, Corey Hendrickson, is also out there, and so we'd love for you to stop by and say hello to him, and he has all that information as well. But at the same time, as I was thinking about this past or the past couple of years, one of the communities here at Kensington that God has used in incredible ways to bring about transformation in people's lives is a ministry that we have called Celebrate Recovery. And Celebrate Recovery has had a huge impact. The program has had a huge impact on my life as well. And so probably for many of you as well. And so what we want to do is we want to bring up two of our leaders to share a little bit of their story to tell us a little bit more about Celebrate Recovery and it's how it's impacted their lives. So Bob and Laura, love for you guys to come up and as they do can we give them a hand everyone wow you guys have you guys have some fans out there right people cheering for you and i think one of the cool things about celebrate recovery that um is uh important for us to understand is that it's not just for adults um, and it's that because for you, Bob, you are a part of leading the landing, which is the Celebrate Recovery program for teens. Correct. And for Laura, you are a part of Celebration Place, which is for Celebrate Recovery focused on children as well. And so I think that is yeah. so incredibly important for us to know. But it's had a huge impact on your lives and God has used both of you to really bring about transformation in the lives of others as well. So I'd love for you just to tell us a little bit about what really prompted you both to take that step and to say yes to being a part of this community. Thanks, Andrew. Um, our journey um, together is uh, quite powerful because of what God has done for us. My journey is what brought us to CR. Uh, it was a battle with addiction and integrity issues. Uh, while I was a teen, um, I had many of the teen hurts that many of us go through, bullying, um, exposure to things that I shouldn't be exposed to, um, going forth in that. And I developed uh, fear, I developed anger, I developed abandonment, uh, self-control, all these issues uh, that I didn't know what to do with. I was felt like I was on my own. Uh, my family going through crisis at that time could not help. And um, I, even though I was a Christian, I didn't know how to go to God about it. And so uh, later as an adult, I went through another crisis of my own. Um, I developed an addiction that uh, really hit its bottom at that point. Um, I really did not know what to do with it. Uh, there wasn't much treatment at that time for it. Uh, so I, I did the best I could, um, but it ended up in a divorce. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, the Lord working in my life, but not me seeing it, presented me with this wonderful woman. And we dated for, you know, four years. And, um, but we got to a point in our relationship where we hit a wall and we didn't see the answer to it. And we didn't know what was going on. So uh, in my anger and frustration, I went back to my addiction. She found out about it. She knew what it was about. And I said, I'll take care of this. You know, um, not knowing that obviously it's, I'm powerless and only God has the power to do that. 
And uh, as I walked through that uh, and said, I really am that powerless, uh, Laura left. And um, there was no way this addiction was too much. So I had to come to God, and I had to come to this community here at the church uh, to really work and delve with this. Uh, I joined a men's Bible study group, and it was at this time that I really learned the lead component, and that was Jesus. Um, I had been a faithful attender of church all my life, but I had these secrets, and I didn't know how to get rid of them, and I really didn't have a relationship with Christ. And through the Bible study of learning what the Bible says and developing relationship with men, um, I came to this realization and that it was not just learning about Jesus himself, but it was knowing that he had the power to give me the peace that I was searching for. And it was only through him that that was possible. Now, come a 2000, um, uh, well, excuse me, uh, about 15 months later, Laura comes back into my life. And after I've had some healing, um, we knew that this was God's will. So we said, as our relationship is moving forward, God is going to be in the middle for us. And as we moved into married life, that is a powerful moment for us to know that God is our center of our life. Um, I did relapse in 2013. Uh, Laura knew about it. And um, it was at that point, you know, she's feeling, how is this possible? Uh, particularly having a year of sobriety. And um, she suggested to go to Yeah, so you took that step. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And Laura, what about you? How, what led you to CR? So I came to CR in September 2013 for, for his addiction. And because um, I was confused. I was angry. I was scared. And I... Because he went to God, he had some healing, and I thought, how could he, you know, relapse? It, it was just confusing to me. And during that time, he had some healing, but I had not. I thought it was all his problem. It was all his issue. So very quickly in CR, I realized I had unresolved issues that I had not dealt with. I had control issues. I had codependency issues. I had fear, anxiety. I went through some depression. I had all these things that... I was able to work through with community in step study with other women, and it was just amazing, truly very powerful, and um, I was able to work some of those, work through some of my issues. And you alluded to it a little bit, but taking steps forward, but for you, Laura, I'd love to uh, ask you um, just to explain to us how it's impacted your marriage, you guys individually, and just especially for you guys as a couple and as husband and wife. Um, personally, I've, I gave you a little bit about that, but also I formed a real relationship with God. And I learned to take all of my problems when I can to him first. And that helped me in relating to Bob, where I wasn't taking those pressures on myself. I wasn't believing that any of his issues were mine. I couldn't control them. God can do that. And I do that with any issue that we have. I pray first to the best most of the time I do, I take it to God first because um, I can't do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And so that's helped us immensely yeah. in our relationship. I'm so grateful yeah. for you guys. Grateful for your leadership as well. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing a bit of your story. Can we give these guys another hand? Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank yeah. you. So if you want more information about CR, you can go out to the lobby. Again, go out to the website. Another misconception sometimes with CR is that it's only for people who are struggling with drugs and alcohol, and about a third of the people in the community do. But is anyone who wants to take a step towards freedom in any other any area of their life, whether it be anger, codependency, whatever it may be. And it has been transformative in the life of this community for so many. So if that is you, I'd encourage you to take that step. And so today we're in the second week of our series, I Feel, and we're going to be talking about something that every single one of us have experienced, and that's feeling overwhelmed and feeling anxious. And for every single one of us, 
<laughs> there's probably, especially in this past year, year and a half, there's been a lot, of bit, a lot of turmoil, a lot of chaos that we've experienced internally. And so we're actually gonna take in a song and we're also, there's also a video attached to it sort of that describes what is happening internally oftentimes when we are going through these seasons and through these times. And then Danny's gonna be up after that and he's gonna lead us in the thought for today. But let's take this song in together. So tell me what's going on. Well, there's a lot going on. My boyfriend has commitment issues. My dad's just been hospitalized. My mom is continually in my business. Work sucks. And uh, my car just broke down. So. There are many times in life when we have to do with a lot of things. It's all about how we choose to react and deal with all that. Turn off the TV, it's starting to freak me out. It's so loud, it's like my ears are bleeding. What am I feeling? Can't look at the ceiling. The light is so bright, it's like I'm overheating. This mine isn't mine. Who am I to judge? Oh, I should be fine, but it's all too much. I get overwhelmed so easily My anxiety creeps inside of me Makes it hard to breathe What's come over me Feels like I'm somebody else I get overwhelmed so easily My anxiety keeps me silent When I try to speak What's come over me Feels like I'm somebody else I get over all of these faces Who don't know what space is The crowds are shut down I'm overstimulated Nobody gets it Saying too sensitive, I can't listen cause I'm high on the exits This mine isn't mine, who am I to judge? Oh, I should be fine, but it's all too much I get overwhelmed so easily, my anxiety creeps inside of me Makes it hard to breathe, what's come over me feels like I'm somebody else I don't know if you had those moments where someone's talking to you and you have so much in your head that you just hear wah, 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 wah. You know, it's like the old Charlie Brown movies <laughs> and you can't hear anything because you have this swirl of stuff in your head. I'm so proud of our team for making that video and that song and performing because it really does put us in a sense of anxiety, doesn't it? I mean, if you came in anxious, I'm so sorry. We just made you more anxious. But, but here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping for a juxtaposition to happen between now and when you walk out of this room. I'm hoping that we feel together this sort of anxiety and this sense of like, yeah, I have a lot in my head. I don't know what you come in carrying or what you're carrying on stream as you're watching this. I don't know what you have in your life, but all of us have something. I hope that by the end, is it possible that our anxiousness and our worry and all the things that we're carrying with us, is it possible by the end that we would learn that there is a undercurrent of something that can counteract that? That there is a peace that we have access to that can actually go alongside that. And hopefully by the end, when we walk out of here, there's a collective exhale and there's a truth that kind of rests deeper in our souls. That's my dream for us today. Lord, uh, that's what we ask of you today. 
There are many asks in this room. You know, you know our hearts. You search our hearts. You know who we are. Before we even say anything out of our lips, you know our request. But Lord, we do come to you today and ask, and I ask, would you do a move of your spirit in this time that we have together to create and cultivate in us a peace that you say is your peace? There's not a place in this world that will give us that peace, even though we look for it all over the place in this world. But the actual thing we're searching for is in you, Jesus Christ. He said, I leave you peace and my peace I give you. Lord, we desire that. I desire that individually and collectively for our communities. So would you do that, Lord? Would you do a move of your spirit? Humble us, draw us closer to you. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of different fears and anxieties that we have. I know growing up, my dad was terrified of spiders. I don't know if you're one of those people, but my dad was, and he would always get in a position where he'd have to be close to them. Like he'd have to be under the crawl space of our home, and he'd tell these stories, and he'd have bad dreams. You know, my son kind of inherited that. I inherited maybe a little bit from my mom a fear of heights. I'm telling you, if I watch videos and someone gets to an edge of something, I don't know if you're like this, and they lean over, whoo, like I can feel it, you know, I can't stand it. But I'll tell you something. Someone has a fear and an anxiety that I didn't even know existed. And that's Andrew Kim. Andrew Kim has a profound anxiety when he hears the popping of a balloon. It's actually a phobia. It's a popping of a balloon anxiety. I can say this because he shared it here. Now, I'm not giving you permission to go up to Andrew with a balloon and pop it. Like, please don't do that. You know, but we always laugh about it. In fact, last week there was a, a staff meeting and, he, and, and there was, they were telling a story about the student ministries and they had this challenge and you blow up a balloon until it pops. And I texted him and I said, dude, you could never do that challenge. There's no way. And he wrote back and he goes, I would run out of that place. You know, that's the thing. I don't know what you have that causes anxiety. We all have a lot of things. But the fact of the matter is this. Those can be kind of funny. Some of them can be very serious. But anxiety exists in our community, in our minds, in our souls. This feeling of worry, this nervousness, this uneasiness is typically about an imminent event that is coming our way or something that we're uncertain of. And we have this weight that we carry. Now, from my testimony, I have to stop for a minute and I have to speak to a contingency of people that are in this room and that are gonna hear my voice. My testimony of Jesus is that I came to him in a profound state of brokenness mentally. I walked through these doors and I had a severe depression and I had anxiety to the point where I was hospitalized a few times and I come in here and I'm searching for something and on an invite here I come and I experience Christ. I wanna talk to you if you're in that seat. I know that seat. I understand where you are. You might have walked in this door and you're feeling that way today. And I want you to know something. I understand it. And I have a compassionate heart for where you're at. And we and I, and I'm giving you my promise here, I want to create a community with Christ at the center that welcomes you into this place and doesn't make you feel worse about your condition. Meaning, whether you can pray hard enough or your faith is strong enough or all those things, if it was that way, you would be healthy. I want to tell you something. That God is going to work incredible things in your life. But it sometimes doesn't happen right away. It's a long journey. And if you're in that journey, I'm with it. And we believe in a holistic approach to that. I certainly do. I've been to counseling and therapy and I've been through all kinds of stuff over the years. But here's what I want you to know. When I came in that door 21 years ago and I had a profound experience with Jesus, this presence that came into my life, it was at that moment after doing all kinds of things to try to rectify this, it was in that moment that something entered in that is tr that's pushed my life to a place of more and more healing as I've learned to grow in my faith. I want you to know something that Jesus Christ can do powerful things and I'm praying for you in particular, but all of us today as we press into what is the really core of Christ and what is he offering us so is it possible to be in the midst of anxiety and struggles and intensity, but still have an undercurrent of peace? And so we're going to look through the eyes of David for week two in this series called I Feel. Last week, as we looked at King David, he was a boy. He was a teenage boy from a poor family. He was a shepherd boy. And God saw him and saw something bigger in him. And he sent his prophet Samuel to now anoint David as the new king as he's removing King Saul from the, as, as the first king. And he's going to place David as the new king. And so this is where we're at this week. And we're going to see how David moves into this role. But there's anxiety to it. It was fascinating about David. I don't know about you. But if someone came to you and said, okay... You are going to be the new queen of the world. 
you know, if it was me, I would just be like, move over. I'm the new, I mean, I wouldn't be the queen. I'd be the new king, right? But I would say, move over. I would have a sense of confidence and arrogance. I would say, hey, okay, now I've got the power. You know what's interesting about David? You know what he did when he found that out? He went back to shepherding. He went back to do his role. He was waiting on God's timing for this to play out. He had a really humble heart even from the beginning. But something happened where King Saul was at war with the Philistines and the people of Israel were there and King's, King Saul is leading him in this and he needs someone to go fight against the giant Goliath. A very famous story. And all of his men kind of cower. And then little David steps up and says, I'll do it. And he goes and he defeats Goliath. And they defeat the Philistine army. And Saul sees this and he takes David in, even making him his son-in-law as David marries Michael, his daughter. And they become close. And then there's a moment that happens where the people start to notice David's gifting over Saul's gifting and their relationship starts to change. And this is where we see anxiety start to enter into David's life and Saul's life. First Samuel. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine Goliath, the women came out of all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. As they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David the tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me only with thousands. What more but can he get but the kingdom? And from that moment on, Saul kept a very close eye on David. There's a shifting in their relationship. There's a shifting between this young warrior and this king. You know, many times our anxiety and our anxiousness comes from a simple thought that we hold on to and we ruminate and we have it go over and over in our mind. And sometimes the very core of that thought is not even true but we hold on to it because we think it's true. And Saul's in that mindset. You know, someone said to me recently that research has showed that when we speak out loud, we speak about 200 or 300 words a minute, but our internal dialogue is at a rate of about 2,000 to 4,000 words that continue to run and ruminate in our mind. And a lot of those are negative. One of the things that I did early on in my battle against depression was that I would write down I did an exercise where I went through my days. I actually had a notebook and I would write down every thought I could pull out of my subconscious into my conscious and I'd write down what I was thinking. It was shocking. It was shocking how much negativity was continually running through my mind. And this is Saul right now. His mind's starting to turn. He's an insecure leader. He sees this young person as a threat to his job and position. He's treating like David like an enemy. You know what the interesting fact is? If you look over David's life, you realize something. He wasn't moving to take Saul's job. Actually, his behavior was quite different. He was serving the king. If you watch his life play out, there were moments where he could have usurped the power and he had the power to usurp and he held back. He wasn't trying to do this, but Saul has built this up in his mind. This account to me is, is interesting and fascinating because anxiety is building up in Saul, but it's also building up in David. Saul lets his anxious thoughts and his worries and insecurity start to take root and rule, even to the point of scheming the worst against David. 1 Samuel 18 says, When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michael loved David, Saul became still even more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. All of us have fear. Sometimes that fear can manifest itself in the worst way, but this is manifesting itself in really the unthinkable. 1 Samuel 19 says, Saul told his own son, Jonathan, and all the attendants to kill David. Now here's what we know about the relationship between Jonathan and David. They were absolutely best friends. So the king's son and David were close. And Jonathan went to the defense of David to his own father, and he said, don't do this. This is an honorable person. You don't want to do this. And Saul retracted that. And he made a vow to his son that he would keep his hands off David. And David returned to do amazing things in leadership. 1 Samuel 19 says this. But right after that, an evil spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. And he was sitting in his house with a spear in his hand. And while David was playing the lyre, here's, here's David. David's a musician. You know, it's Nate. You're David. You know, you're playing your song to the king, you know. And here is Saul. He's got a spear in his hand. And what does he do? Saul tries to pin him to the wall with his spear. 
I guess he didn't like the song. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. I would think so, wouldn't you? I'm out of here. Let me ask you something. I mean, that's probably never happened to any of you in here. I hope not. But have you ever had a boss, someone that has power, a coach, a neighbor, a coworker, a teacher, someone in your life who has authority over you and has the ability to make your life difficult? Have you ever had someone in your life like that? You know, one of our child's life, uh, he had a coach that was really difficult. And we knew it was difficult at the time, uh, but we're not really the kind of parents to step into that kind of meaning like, we, we don't, hey, you need to play my kid more, you do this thing. You know, we keep monitoring it, but we didn't know. And years later, I had a conversation with our child. And he says, you know, this was really bad. And he started telling me stories. And man, some of these stories, it was as if this coach was out to crush his soul. And he said to me something. He said, you know, even to this day, all these years later, it still bothers me. There's still parts of it that are with me. Made me start to think this week as I was reading this scripture, if you're in a position of power, and by the way, all of you are leaders in some realm, but if you're in a position of power, you must continually monitor the ways that you lead, the condition of your heart. Because you know what? We can be the source of other people's anxiety. We can actually be those sources. You may not be literally throwing a spear at someone, but your words could be a spear to somebody's soul. And so Saul is really wounded, David, but we can relate to that in some way. First Samuel 19 says, Saul sent men to David's house at one point to watch it, and he was planning on killing him in the morning. And even his own daughter, Michael, who's married now to David, tricks her father, protects her husband, says, you gotta get out of here, <laughs> releases David down, and David flees. He is in the grip of a situation of full anxiety. It says in 1 Samuel 23 that David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into Saul's hands. While David was at Harash in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. Think about what he's going through. Every moment he is trying to escape the anxiety, the level that is building up in him. He is enemy number one of Saul's. And you can feel it. You can say no matter where he goes is the wrath of Saul. And he's dealing with this profound sense of anxiety. And he writes about it. It's one of the things that I absolutely love about David. He writes so honestly. He writes so truthfully. You know, I've heard many followers of Christ many times say, don't talk about the negative because it'll manifest itself. Just talk about the positive. When I read the scripture, I see David being so honest He's so raw, especially within some of the Psalms, Psalm 140, 142, a number of other Psalms. He writes so beautifully about this moment. Here's David hiding in a cave, in the, it racked with anxiety. And this is what he writes. He says, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I make my requests. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path in the way in which I walk. They have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. And I cry out to you, O Lord, and I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. God, attend to my cry, for I have been brought very Lo, deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than me. Bring my soul out of prison. Have you ever been in that moment where you're just, you feel alone? You feel like no one acknowledges you, that you feel overwhelmed? This is David. You know what I love about David every time, though? He just turns it a little at the end of these Psalms. As he's speaking so honestly, he turns it. And this is what he says. Bring my soul out of this prison so that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal with me bountifully with me. What an honest, deep plea to God. One filled with worry and anxiety and a sense of being alone, but, and still, a sense of there's an undercurrent of hope, some kind of peace. We know that we're not gonna experience more than likely this level of persecution, many of us. But I'll tell you something, this best, you know, every week I get the chance to, to, to speak 
I'm not kidding you. Every, it almost happens every time. As I'm speaking on a particular topic or a particular part of scripture, something happens in my own life or in my community's life that really represent and mirror what we're teaching. So this past week, just a few days ago, I received an email. And the email had an attachment, and usually I won't open attachments or anything like that, but it kind of went through the protocols. And I looked at it, and there was something about the way the person wrote the introduction that I thought, you know, I think this is okay. And I opened up this email, and like a novel opened up about this woman's life. And so she went on to say that her husband had left her not long ago. She's a single mom of several children. She's living in this general area. She's living in a small space. She was struggling to find a job. She found something. She started to kind of survive and started to get through, and then COVID hit. When COVID hit, they all kind of isolated into their home. They didn't, go out, they didn't leave their home for a long periods of time. She's overwhelmed by this stuff. She finally got a little bit of a job, something you could do in the home just to survive and eke out this living. And it was felt hopeless. It felt really absolutely difficult in this moment. And then she said she started to have medical issues, started to have dental issues. And because she didn't have the money, she couldn't do anything about it. But they got worse and worse. And finally she went to a particular dentist. She said the kind that maybe poor people go to because that's all I could afford. And that particular place didn't do a good job. And it made it worse. And she reached out and she said, I am at a point of hopelessness. I don't know where to turn. I have nothing. And so we connected to some people. We're hoping that there's a dentist in our community, somebody that would take her in and evaluate, and that's what we're shooting for. But here's the amazing part of this email. She writes all of that, and I want you to see how it's a modern-day version of Psalm 142. Close to the end, she writes this. Today, I was driving to the gas station to put air in two of the tires on my car that continually go flat. When I cried out to God for some direction in that moment, for hope that there would be a way through the storm, that's when he, and I did not write this, this is her writing, that's when he bestowed upon me a sense of peace. Like he was willing to carry me through hopelessness and pain. I love how she worded that. I cried out to the Lord that he would give me something And it was in that moment that he bestowed upon me, that he handed me a sense of a peace in a situation that it shouldn't be. It's so beautiful. It's such a, listen to what David said. First lines, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. I bring all my asks to him. It's amazing to me. You know, I'm really hoping that that, that we don't know the outcome. We don't know how that's gonna, gonna play out. But we do know that we wanna engage and we wanna do that. But that was just an amazing moment to really reflect the heart of God. When Jesus walked the earth, he was training his disciples. He was training them in the real essence of the kingdom of God. And when he was going to leave them, he gave them a lot of last minute instructions. Things that you would, you know, you know, when you don't have a lot of time with somebody, you don't mince words. You say, here, you know, if I know I have 10 minutes, 10 minutes with you, I'm going to go to you and I'm going to say, here are the 10 things I need you to know, you know. And this is one of those moments. Happens in the gospel of John. Jesus is going to leave them and he looks at his disciples and says this. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Say my peace. peace. Say it like you mean it. Peace Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be afraid. It's like I'm going to give you something. I'm going to leave something with you, but it's mine. (laughs) It's like I'm going to leave something, but it's mine. It's my peace. And the world can never give that because my peace is different. Now, the word here is really interesting. Irene is the word, and it's fascinating what it said. This week was something that kind of opened up to me. I'd never seen this particular translation or definition, and it really is fascinating. That word in this scripture and in the one I'm going to share in a little bit, it means this, the tranquil state, the calm state of a soul that is assured of their salvation in Christ. A soul that doesn't have any kind of fear from God and is content with whatever happens on this earth, any circumstances. A peace only that you can get from God. A soul content and assured that there's salvation, that there's something bigger than this place. That's why you can't attain it from this world. There's nothing in this world that has that other than the person of Jesus. That peace cannot be made from this world. It comes from the source of Christ. 
And so when I read that letter, I felt that. I felt this thing. I experienced that 21 years ago. Something entered in. And the person in Scripture that I think speaks so powerfully to this so many times is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul writes about this, and he has a lot of different uh, situations that really give him so much credibility to say, this piece is a real piece that you can learn to get. And so we're going to tap into the Scripture that talks about that in a minute. Before we do that, we're going to receive... Our offering. So if you come uh, to, to, to give thank you so much, uh, we are part of this moment because we want to be part of a community that's rooted in this kind of peace. And so we give to push through for, for people like this single mom, for people like all of our friends in Afghanistan and around the world, we want to be part of a movement of peace rooted in Jesus. So uh, there's a number of different ways that we give. Of course, if you're online, we give a number of different ways through text. You can also do the app. Uh, you can go on our website. Uh, you can send a check here. And then also someone really did a great job making these beautiful boxes. We used to have like Home Depot buckets for the first several months during the pandemic. And now someone made these beautiful wooden boxes. When you leave here, you can be part of that. But I just want to say thank you uh, for the generosity in this community. It's incredible. Well, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a church in Philippi. And he's writing from prison. He's in prison writing to this church. And here's what he says in Philippians 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Now let me ask you something. If you're in prison and there's an imminent chance that you are going to die relatively soon and you're writing to someone, is your first words, rejoice. Rejoice in everything. Would you write that? I would be like, come save me. You know, but he's saying what? Rejoice. And he doesn't say just rejoice in something. He says, rejoice always. I say it again, rejoice, be gentle, let it be evident. Why? Because God is near. And then he follows up with this. Do not be anxious about anything. Say those words. Do not be anxious about anything. One more time. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving and a, a, a really, really a posture of gratefulness, present your requests to God. Do not be anxious about anything. He doesn't say, hey, look, you know, you might be a little anxious, okay. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, you don't worry about it. And he's like, no, no, no. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, approach God. Interesting about that phrase, be anxious for nothing. It comes from a word that means to be troubled with cares. He's saying, don't be troubled with any of your cares. And Paul doesn't make this just an option. He's making this a command to his community. He's commanding. He's saying this isn't an option. And one, one person said, us being overwhelmed and troubled by, deeply by our cares of this world is an area that solely belongs to God. It solely belongs to God. We take that many times on our own shoulders. This solely belongs to God. And Paul's saying, do you realize, do not be anxious about anything. Hand those things to God. And he's commanding that. One person says it makes us the father of our household instead of us being the child. I think about our kids. If you have small kids, when they're little kids, you know, uh, you know, Amy and I are in the midst of financial things and all the things that are happening in our home. And we don't go to our kids and go, do you realize how hard this is? Do you realize the weight on our shoulders? You know, we don't do that. Well, we, we could if we want to make us feel guilty, but, you know, and we probably did. But, they're, they're, but they're, all they want to do is play with their toys. They don't want to know about reality. What Paul's saying is you realize that God is in control and you are the child. And you're to cast that upon God. Cast your anxieties upon him, First Peter. Who by worrying, Jesus said, can add a single to their life, Matthew 6. And so we do this. We we're not anxious about anything. We pray to God and we ask, which is exactly what the single mom did in the email. And then what, is, what does it say? What is the outcome of that? What I found so fascinating is when we pray and we ask, does it say in Scripture that God's just going to give you everything you prayed for? You know, it's like, okay, no problem. I'm glad you asked. Here you go. This is what it says. In the peace of God, say peace of God, peace of God. which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Same word, Irene, peace a tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. First thing I want you to think about is this. Peace is an inner state of being apart from our circumstances. It's an inner state of being apart from everything that's happening around us. Think about the Apostle Paul. 
The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned. He was tortured. He didn't have a home many times. He didn't have food. Yet he had this idea that there was something bigger that he could have within his circumstances. In fact, how does it do it? Listen to verse 11 and 12. He says, for I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I really take comfort in the idea of I have learned. That means that there's possibilities for us that we can actually learn what this means. I have learned. Oh, Paul, you've learned in all your circumstances, you've learned. Well, guess what? I can learn to what? Move into this peace. You can learn. We can learn. So peace is an inner state of being apart from circumstances. Second is this. Peace is about presence, not absence. It says this, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That word guard actually means, it's a military word. It means that it's fortifying a city so it doesn't have an invasion. It's a coming around a heart and a soul and protecting it. Having an army, think about this, around your heart and your mind and your soul. It's a presence of something. Early on in my struggle with depression, I always thought it was an absence. Quit thinking negatively. Work on yourself here. Do this, do that. I think those things are actually very valuable. But it wasn't until something was added, only that comes from God, the presence of God, that there was a power by God's spirit to start to actually move towards true healing. And that's what Paul's saying. You know, there's this, uh, if any of you are motorcycle people here, you know, there's this group called BACA, Bikers Against Child Abuse. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, this community, but one of our tech guys, Dennis Anderson, told us about it years ago. And bike, Bikers Against Child Abuse is interesting because they are passionate about check, uh, protecting the most vulnerable children, especially those that have to go before their abuser sometimes in court in those situations. And so they tell a story about a boy who has to go in front of his abuser in court. And he was so terrified in the weeks leading up to it that he couldn't sleep. And so here's what they did, the members of Baca. They would show up at his house at night and they would surround his house. <laughs> These big bikers, you know. And they would surround his house. And the little boy would look out and he would see them surrounding the house and he could go to sleep. I don't remember how long they did that for, but they did that every night and he felt secure. And then they surrounded him and took him to the court as they went to the court. Now, I don't know if they let him in the court, but they were there. And one reporter or somebody had asked this little boy, are you scared to go before your abuser? And he said, no, because I have an army of people that are much stronger. In this way, this supernatural power and peace of God that only comes from the person of Jesus gives you that in your, in your spirit. Look, I gotta make something clear. Following God sometimes is an incredibly mysterious thing. You know, when I think about that time back in the back of this auditorium where I had this force enter me, this broken person that was so struggling, I can't define what that is. I just know it took me on another trajectory. Now I look at it and say it's the power of God's spirit, but I didn't have any words then. There's a mystery to this, but God moves in the way that he wants to move. And when he moves, he enters in his presence. And by the very nature of his presence, it starts to push out these other things to the periphery. And that's what Paul is saying. It's, 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 it's a peace that is about presence, not only absence. And then he ends with this, Philippians 4. He says, finally, brothers and sisters... Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure and lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent, if anything is praiseworthy, praiseworthy, think about these things. You know, I read this scripture for many years, and I've even heard it taught this way, that people will say, just think about beautiful things. Think about the positive things, the lovely things of life, a sunset, the way that you love your dog. I don't know, all these kinds of things. Think about these admirable things, trust, and the things that you love about your people, all these kinds of things. But as you study the scriptures deeper, you realize something, what Paul's doing here. Paul's not talking about the lovely things of the world, actually. What Paul is actually saying in this scripture is this. Church, do you realize that there's only one source of nobility. There's only one source of truth. There's only one source of righteousness and purity and loveliness and praiseworthiness. There's only one source. He's pointing their eyes back to the person of Jesus and say, don't forget 
that there's actually only one source of all of these things. And you need to ruminate on those things and think of those things and pursue those things and we'll cause closer to those. Don't forget about the person of Jesus. It's the only source of this. And Jesus says, I give peace, but it's mine. And if you want it, here you go. Come close. And Paul's like, do you realize that Jesus is the source and then he ends and says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And then what? The God of peace will be with you. A reign of peace will be with you. Put it into practice. He's saying step. Start to walk. You know, there's a reason why we do care groups and classes and groups and all these things that we're trying to do here. Because we have a deep desire for you to not walk out of here alone and try to do it on your own. You heard it from Bob Crow up here. It's like I tried to get over this myself. Guess what Bob experienced? The presence of God that brought him into a journey of a continuation of learning what it means to walk in peace and power in the presence of God. That's what we desire for this community. I'll end with this thought. My friend Bill was here last service. He's here every, every first service on Sunday pretty much. And Bill's been through a lifetime of struggle. 40 years as an alcoholic, uh, ad- addicted to all kinds of stuff. Right now he's going through a major health crisis. He's one of my heroes. And he's one of my mentors. Years ago he said, you need to get into a step study. You need to go to CR. You need to do these things. I'm, okay, I'll do whatever you think, Bill. And uh, he walked me through a year and a half of what we call a step study, which is really getting deep inside of your life and saying, okay, Lord, what do you want me to see? And at one point he said something profound to me. He said, when we lament on the past, it leads to depression. When we focus too much on the future, it creates anxiety. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, I never really put it in that way, but he's right. When I focus too much and I lament too much and, and, and I regret too much about my past, it leads me into a darker space. And when I look ahead and I can't see and I'm not sure where I'm going, it creates an anxiety. A great mentor of mine, Jack Wilson, says this. He adds to that. He said, we look to the past to learn. We look to the future to prepare. And I thought, oh, that's beautiful. And I wrote that down. And then I added something this week. And we come to the presence for peace. We come to the very present moment for peace. Because this is the only moment you can experience peace. This moment you're in right now and every moment that follows after. And what our world teaches us is get far ahead, lament, and God is saying, would you come close? Would you be in my presence? Would you pursue me and make me the object of your affection? Would you put me number one? Would you place me in your mind so that when you start to think about things, when you wake up in the morning, I'm on your heart and mind. When you go to bed, I'm on your heart and mind. When I'm walking through the day and I'm looking at someone and I, and, and, and I feel like there's something, and God's gonna say, speak to that person because I'm listening to God because I made him the object of my affection. And God's saying, come to me. We have a lot of anxieties. We have a lot of stresses. And I'm not making light of that. But I will say to you, it is the presence and the power of God in the very present moment that gives you an ability to have an undercurrent of peace even when there's chaos in the top. Lord, thank you for what you do in our community week after week after week after week. Thank you for the single mom having the courage to reach out and giving her the courage to write her story. And she said it was hard to write. She didn't want to send it. Thank you for her hitting that send button. Lord, I ask for something miraculous to happen there. Activate somebody in our community to care for her. Lord, we thank you that you would offer you. And Lord, in you, there's something that nothing in this world can actually do. Nothing in this world can actually offer. You say, I give you my peace. This peace I leave with you and I give it to you and it's my peace, but I give it to you. Lord, drag us into your presence. Activate your peace in our heart. Draw us closer to you and connect us deeper through the love of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
There is a light Shines brighter than the sun He steals the night Cast no shadow There is hope Should oceans rise and mountains fall He never fails
love those words. I love declarations like that where we say that God is our refuge. We say that he's overcome. And a lot of times those songs come out of moments when we're on the mountaintop, when the storm has dissolved, when the situation has changed. And those are wonderful moments because God builds something in us. Perhaps some of us in this room, we're not on that place. We're not on the mountaintop. We're still in the midst of the storm. And we need to hear Jesus say something to us that brings peace in the midst of it. It reminds me in this Gospels, the stories of the Gospels where Jesus' friends, his disciples are in a boat and they're in a storm. They're actually in a physical storm and it looks like they're gonna lose their lives, they're gonna lose their boat and it's all over. And Jesus stands up and says to the storm, speaks to the actual circumstance and says to that circumstance, peace be still and the wind and the waves as we read about obey him and all is made calm. See, sometimes Jesus does that. He speaks to circumstances. I know we've all, if we've followed Jesus for any length of time, we, we can look back and see where Jesus has changed the circumstance. Sometimes he doesn't speak to the circumstance. He speaks to us in the midst of it, and we change, even though the circumstance hasn't. So this next song, and just maybe right in this moment, we just invite Jesus to say these words to us right here, right now. Peace, be still. Acts is gonna lead us in this moment. Would you stand with me if you're able to? And let's just tie this day together by just focusing on this, this word that Jesus says, peace, be still.
May the Lord bless us and keep us. May he grant us strength to live through troubled times. May he fill us with his peace and grace equal to every need and his peace which surpasses all our understanding. May he grant us the wisdom and the will to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. I really do pray for a profound move of God's peace individually and collectively, not just here, but through all of our communities, all of the churches that are surrounding this community, not just Kinsey's, it's not about Kensington, it's about Jesus. And so we pray for that for this region and around the world. Hey, next week we're gonna, uh, is I feel conflicted. And so what I want you to do is I just want you to bring someone that you don't like and you're fighting with next week if you could. Because uh, we just wanna see what that's like, you know. <laughs> But, but, but I really do invite you back next week. This I Feel series is interesting because God gave us emotions, but he actually gave us power. And emotions are powerful as long as they're under the control of the Lord. So I would you know, invite you back for that. When you go out, please connect, 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 connect. There's a reason for that. And so connect out there. Next week, just so you know, if you're brand new to this community and you're online and you're brand new, uh, to this community. We're gonna have a gathering out there. We'd love to, you to hear our hearts. It's gonna be in the chat room uh, during the, the first, second service. So please be part of that. Love to meet you and love to see you. Have a great week.